So when we were kids, we got a lot of experience learning just how flammable fuel was by screwing around. I mean, I don't know. If you're a boy, you probably like to light things on fire a lot. And uh, when our parents weren't looking, we'd get the lawnmower gas or whatever we could find and light stuff on fire. And this experience taught us that gas is pretty damn flammable and it's really hard to put out. So in this week's video, we're going to talk about how not to die by fire and how to maybe save your car and save a lot of expenses by being prepared for fire. Now, there's been a few accidents lately that have really piqued our interest in being a lot more fire safe. Uh, we're at Grid Life at Laguna Seca, and there was like a brand new A90 Supra that somehow caught on fire. And man, that thing burned down right in front of our pit space. And uh, it burned for a good 45 minutes, and the Laguna Seca fire team couldn't put the car out. And the city fire department had to eventually come, and they had a really hard time putting the car out. So we saw a brand new Supra burn to like a heap of slag right in front of us. It was pretty awful, and I really feel sorry for the owner of that car. Um, one of our friends, Michelle Abate, uh, got into a pretty bad accident as a result of a brake failure. And even though she was in a state-of-the-art race car with all the safety equipment, um, when she hit the wall, her car still caught on fire and burned down. And uh, she was really lucky to uh, escape without uh, too many fire injuries, at least. Um, and one of our local fun drift days, a guy had his uh, newly constructed Corvette drift car burned down to the ground. And a lot of these things could have been prevented with a little bit of fire safety. Maybe Michelle's couldn't have, but the other ones could have. Um, so we're going to talk about some things you could do to not have that happen to you. Because basically, fire sucks, and so does burns. Uh, burns are some of the most painful injuries to uh, suffer, and, and if you get burned bad, that's not a really good way to go either. Um, the first thing we're going to talk about is a uh, fuel cell. Now, uh, if you have a late model car, uh, you probably don't need a fuel cell because late model cars are designed with a lot of safety in mind for uh, their fuel systems. They usually have centrally located, uh, well-shielded gas tanks, and those are going to be kind of hard to pop, and, except for maybe the worst uh, accidents on the track. Uh, I have yet to see a late model car, other than that Supra, catch on fire uh, due to accident anyway. Um, but an older car, like if you have a early 90s car, or, you know, um, but an older car, um, like let's say you have an early 90s car, like in our case, we're building a uh, S13 race car for my daughter. The stock gas tank is in a really bad position. On the S13, it's pretty far in the back of the car, and it doesn't have a all that much protection from impact. Um, plus, in the case of her S13, the stock fuel tank was rotten, and Nissan doesn't make replacements anymore, so uh, you know we decided to go ahead and spend some money and put a fuel cell. Now, one of the best fuel cells you can get is, um, they're made by Radium. Uh, Radium is probably makes some of the best uh, fuel system stuff on the in the industry, and you probably see a lot of radium used in our videos and on our uh, personal project cars. I mean, it's good stuff, and the fuel cell is uh, no exception. Now, this is a radium fuel cell. Um, it's ethanol and exotic fuel safe, so uh, it's good for uh, ethanol, E85, methanol, and whatever exotic fuel. Now, a lot of uh, fuel cells and uh, factory fuel components aren't safe with uh, ethanol like uh, 85 or ethanol tends to dissolve things and if you have an older car like uh, probably made before the year 2000 chances are that none of the fuel system is compatible with ethanol um, but in the case of this fuel cell it is so it has a special uh, bladder now fuel cells have like a rubbery bladder inside their container uh, what, what happens is if you get in a really bad accident and let's say your fuel cell gets totally smashed or uh, 
even punctured. The uh, bladder is a soft, rubbery material um, that's reinforced with um, Kevlar and things like that, so it doesn't rip. Um, this way, the bladder can be really smashed, but it won't rupture and it won't let fuel out. Um, the radium one has a rubbery plastic, and uh, it's this green stuff that you can probably see around here. And this is exotic, um, impervious to any exotic fuel. Um, also, a fuel cell is uh, full of foam. Now you see this yellow foam here. What the foam does is, let's say you get into some ungodly accident and even the bladder ruptures, the foam prevents the fuel from gushing out and uh, uh, contributing to a huge fire. Also, the foam prevents uh, vapors from becoming explosive inside the fuel cell. So even if it ignites, it'll act kind of like a wick and like slowly burn instead of explode. So um, finally, the uh, foam actually acts like an anti-slosh device. So it keeps the fuel from sloshing around and helps you get a more consistent pickup. Um, so the, uh, um, the radium fuel cell has this uh, yellow exotic fuel resistant foam. So it won't get eaten up like the foam in the regular uh, fuel cell. So the fuel cell contributes a lot to impact safety and the overall safety of uh, your fuel system. Now the radium is really neat. Uh, we have this optional stainless steel cage for the fuel cell, which makes it a lot easier to uh, put in your car. So your fabricator can weld this guy in and the fuel cell will just drop right in. Also, uh, for the fuel cell, we got uh, Radium's internal FCST surge tank. So, this is a uh, surge tank. It goes inside the fuel cell, which to me is a big bonus for safety. Um, a lot of you have probably experienced when you're on the track with your stock fuel system, once your fuel starts getting low, about a quarter tank or you know, even more in some cars, you hang a turn and the car dies because um, all your fuel sloshed away from the pickup. Well, with the uh, internal surge tank, uh, you have a lift pump and the lift pump keeps the surge tank full and the surge tank is a small volume little tank that feeds your engine and fuel doesn't slosh around in this little guy. So your engine always has a continuous supply of fuel. Now, um, you know, a lot of people put an external surge tank on their race car. Uh, it does the same thing, but what I don't like about the external surge tank is, you know, it's uh, another thing full of fuel inside your car, and there's lines and, and wiring and all this stuff that's, um, in addition, outside of your, your fuel tank. So th these are all potential sources of ignition and things that could cause a fire. Um, with the radium uh, surge tank, it's inside the fuel cell. It's protected better than anything, and it's all contained. So, um, you know, this isn't going to contribute to uh, any more chances of fire leakage or anything. Radium was the, one of the pioneers for internal surge tanks, and, uh, you know, I think this is like a big plus in safety. Plus, it also makes sure your engine gets nice solid fuel down to the last drop. Some other things that we did to add safety to our fuel cell is um, we added these uh, valves. Well, this valve comes standard in the fuel cell, and it's the fuel filler valve. So it's a one-way check valve, so um, when you're dumping fuel in, it opens up and, uh, you know, lets fuel into the cell. Then the advent of a crash, or if the car flips over, it automatically shuts. Or if the fuel cell gets smushed, uh, it, it slams shut and prevents any fuel from escaping. Uh, this is an important safety device that um, you should add to your fuel cell if it doesn't already have it. Uh, it comes with radium fuel cells. Um, the other thing is the anti-rollover valve. Now, um, this is a valve that you put on your fuel cell vent, and it um, has a ball in there. And if the car flips over, the ball rolls into position and it blocks the vent so you don't have any fuel escaping through your uh, fuel cell vent. Uh, this is really good if the car flips over 
and you're upside down and stuck in the car. And in this situation, with these two valves, you're not going to have any fuel spilling out of your fuel system to uh, potentially cook off and uh, wreck your day. Another safety device we're using is a dry brake. Now the dry brake takes the place of your, um, of your fuel filler cap and it's a self-sealing check valve so you never have fuel escaping. The only time uh, anything can go in and out is when you're fueling and you use this rig that has another uh, special valve in the top of it. And when you want to fill it up, you just, uh, you just stick this into this and you push and the fuel automatically dumps into your car. Uh, you lift off, it's sealed. So like, let's say you're f fueling or something and God forbid, maybe somehow you spill, which would be pretty difficult with this rig. Um, if you jump back with the fuel rig, your fuel system seals and there's no fuel flying around to contribute to more fire. So this is another uh, safety device that uh, Radium has. Now that our fuel, onboard fuel is really safe in the car, there's a few, few tips I can tell you to make the rest of the car pretty safe. Uh, one of them is to not cheap out and always use top quality hose and fittings. Now if you're going to be running ethanol or any kind of exotic fuel, E85, uh, you got to be sure to get um, exotic fuel compatible or safe fuel lines. Um, you know, like most of the uh, fitting and hose companies have this kind of stuff. So look for that ethanol safe or E85 compatible. Um, generally, it's uh, like a braided steel or braided um, aramid, uh, like Kevlar or something, like, like this line. And um, in the case of this line, the line itself is made out of Teflon, which is uh, chemically inert. It's not going to react to any kind of fuel. Uh, they do have like special reinforced rubbers that are lined with a Teflon-like material, uh, and that's impervious to ethanol, but you know, make sure it's exotic fuel safe uh, if you're going to be running ethanol. And in my opinion, nowadays, um, ethanol and stuff sneaks its way into all kinds of fuel, so it's probably good to plumb your car with uh, this kind of line, especially if it's an older car from the 90s. Um, the other thing is, my opinion, try not to cheap out with your fuel lines and, uh, you know, run good quality A and fittings. Um, you know, these are really positive, seal really good. In my experiences, um, probably 80% of your DNFs are caused by uh, plumbing or wiring problems. So I always encourage people to spend a little extra money on their plumbing and wiring. Um, you know, the plumbing and wiring is the cause of uh, more fires, more blown engines, more just the car not running right than probably any other thing. I mean, it's at least a good 80%, so don't cheap out on your plumbing. Uh, the other thing you might want to do is when you're plumbing your car, make sure you have enough strain relief in your lines so if the car wrecks and the chassis deforms, uh, you, you're not yanking fuel lines uh, you know, out, out of their fittings and you don't have fuel spraying all over. So give a little extra slack. Um, in your fuel lines and you know even oil lines and things like that don't don't have it at the shortest possible length you know give it a little room to flex and bend and not yank out i mean you get in a really bad wreck nothing's going to help you there but you know you, it would suck if you're in kind of a minor wreck kind of bend things a little still fixable then you have a fuel line pull out and the whole thing burns down uh, the last tip that a lot of people don't realize is um, when you have your fuel pressure regulator, you know, like a lot of companies uh, mount the regulator on the uh, fuel rail. And, um, you know, they even probably sell them like that. But something we learned in off-road racing is you don't ever want to do that. Like, let's say you have your regulator on the rail. And of course, your engine's going to like shift around the mounts and vibrate and stuff as, as you give it gas or whatnot, or just vibrations or chassis flex. And what happens is over time, your fuel line can unscrew because this side's moving and this side isn't. 
and it just gets a little loose, and then you have fuel spraying all over your engine. If it's at the end of the uh, fuel rail, it's probably pretty close to exhaust. Fuel sprays on the exhaust, and next thing you know, your car's on fire. So the best practice is mount your regulator on the firewall or someplace away from heat that's on the chassis, and then have your fuel line go from your regulator to your fuel rail and put enough strain relief so it could uh, move and vibrate without unscrewing. Um, you know, it's a safety tip that isn't talked, at, talked about a lot, and uh, it's pretty significant and kind of comes from off-road racing where there's a lot of movement in the components. But uh, keep that in mind when you're putting together your fuel system. So now that you have your fuel system safe, um, we're going to go talk about extinguishers, like what happens when your car does catch on fire. Now, a lot of people, especially grass, grassroots people, don't even carry a fire extinguisher in their car when they're doing like a casual track day. And some track day organizations uh, don't require a fire extinguisher in the car. I mean, I've been to some casual track days myself, and I'm guilty of not having a sting extinguisher in, in my car. But... Um, just a little bit of preparation and effort could save you a lot of grief and money and maybe injury if something actually does happen. Now, I think your lowest level that you want to have is uh, one of these um, element extinguishers. Uh, these things are kind of like uh, road flares. Uh, you strike them and light them just like a road flare. They're about the size of a road flare. Um, and they're about as stable as a road flare. Like you could just leave these in the car for years and they'll still work when you need them. They're so small that you can just tuck them away in your uh, glove box or, uh, you know, when you're on the track, you should probably put it somewhere you can, where you can reach it. Now, Element has these kind of universal brackets. Um, Sparco just came out with this really cool bracket uh, that holds an Element. Uh, you can bolt it anywhere, and it's actually designed to uh, fit on the side mounts of your typical racing seat. But, I mean, with the holes, there's several holes, and you can actually mount this anywhere where it's handy. Now, the way these uh, elements work is you strike them and light them like a flare, and the smoke that's shooting out of the end is actually like uh, potassium ions and nitrogen gas. Now the potassium ions have a really strong positive charge and they uh, combine with oxygen, rendering the oxygen unable to uh, bur uh, contribute to burning. Um, it becomes a potassium oxide or something. Um, also nit nitrogen gas is a uh, non flammable gas and that also helps blanket the fire and extinguish it. Um, so the element comes in two sizes. Uh, this little guy goes for 50 seconds, and this bigger one goes for 100. Uh, that's way more than any uh, typical fire extinguisher will, will go. Um, my experience is that with certain kind of fires, these things knock them out like you wouldn't believe, but they, they have a few disadvantages. Like in an enclosed area, like an engine compartment or in a wheel well, or the interior of your car, um, they seem to work pretty good. But out in the open, like if uh, there's a fire with fuel on the ground and it's uh, you know not enclosed at all, they don't seem to work too good because some of that is like uh, you know wind or a breeze or even being out in the open air will cause the uh, the potassium ion gas and the nitrogen gas to disperse before it can really get in a position to snuff out the flames. So, I mean, it's not like an everything extinguisher, but neither is the more common dry powder. Like if you ever tried to put out a fire with dry powder, it's in a lot of situations it hardly even works. And if you don't know how to use it, uh, it can even make the fire worse. Now, the other thing I like about these elements is um, they're totally non-toxic. They don't leave any residue. Um, if you ever light off a dry powder extinguisher, oh man, it wrecks stuff. I mean, it corrodes everything, and it's super corrosive. Things will start to corrode within hours of being touched with that powder. And uh, I mean, you let, you let that loose in your car, uh, like a dry powder one, you're probably going to have to pull the motor and 
spend hours and hours cleaning everything. Um, you know, like we've, we've been hit by the track dry powder extinguishers uh, when racing, and I mean, we had to rebuild the motor, build new wiring harnesses, and um, man, it was awful. That powder got into everything and corroded it. Uh, this happened a couple times, but with the element, there's no residue, uh, it's not corrosive. You don't have to worry too much about breathing it because it's non-toxic. I mean, I wouldn't try to breathe it, but uh, got to use some common sense. But it's uh, supposed to be non-toxic. So, um, you know, these things are so handy and so safe and so small. There's no excuse not to have one of these in the glove box of every car you own and probably, um, you know, strapped to your cage or um, attached to your seat with the sparkle bracket, uh, you should always have one of these. Even if you have a traditional fire system, fire systems are expensive to discharge, so maybe you want to try hitting it with one of these first. Uh, which, uh, that gives us a segue into um, fire extinguishers. Now those uh, little ABC cheapo fire extinguishers they sell, um, Sure, that'll put out a small fire, but I've never seen that control like a, a really, really going engine compartment fire. Like, um, usually those ones when the whole engine compartment's going, it'll just laugh at those dry powder extinguishers. Um, and if uh, the person operating the extinguisher doesn't really diligently try to get to the base of the flames, I've seen the powder actually like almost burn like a powder explosion. and. You know, it's not supposed to burn, but I've actually seen it make a fire uh, worse. So I'm not a big fan of those um, and the corrosion they leave. Um, you know, Halon used to be the stuff for fire extinguishers for like a car. Like a little puff of Halon would knock any fire out in seconds. But, um, you know, they found out that that depletes the ozone layer. And they've had a hard time finding any kind of extinguisher for like hydrocarbon fires that's anywhere close to as effective until recently. So they came out with this new stuff called Novak 1230. And Novak is a fluorinated liquid. It's kind of like Halon, but Halon's a gas. Um, Novak is a liquid. I haven't had the experience of having to put something out with uh, Novak yet. But it's supposed to be super effective, like uh, just like Halon, and possibly even more effective than Halon. So Novik's a liquid. You spray it on the fire, and the heat of the fire uh, causes it to vaporize instantly. But it has something like um, like 50% more heat absorbing capability than water or other common extinguishers. So. The Novak draws a lot of heat out of the fire. Um, it also, when it turns into a gas, um, combines with the air and kind of like takes the oxygen out of the environment so the fire goes out. Um, one of the things that I see is kind of bad about these elements is that you're just spraying gas, but uh, it can snuff the fire out, but everything's still pretty hot. So it can, you know, when this thing runs out, I've seen, I've seen fires uh, reflash afterwards because everything's still glowing hot. With Novik, you get the uh, cooling of the, uh, of the agent, which uh, can reduce everything below the flash point easy. So I, I think um, this stuff's going to be a lot more effective. Um, the other thing is that it's so effective that the containers are really small compared to uh, other agents. Um, and like... Um, you know, Halon, it's uh, non-toxic, and it also doesn't leave any residue, and it's not corrosive. I mean, I wouldn't drink this stuff or breathe it in, in on purpose, but um, it's supposed to be non-toxic, and it won't wreck everything like powder. So this is the uh, Sparco handheld extinguisher. I mean, there's a lot of the stuff in here. I mean, you could probably put out pretty serious fire with this guy. Um, you can have one of these in your car, but you're going to have to put some thought into mounting it. Um, you want to mount it really solidly, and you got to think that when you're in the wreck, um, you know, it might see 8 or 10 Gs. So this little extinguisher is going to possibly weigh 100 pounds, so you don't want that to rip off and um, 
you know, like being you. So you have to mount it really sturdy and be mindful of that. A lot of, a lot of guys use those little plastic brackets that come with their extinguisher and you know, when you crash, that's just going to break and that extinguisher is going to become a missile inside of the car to wreck you. And that's why a, a lot of racing sanctioning bodies nowadays require that you have to have a metal bracket. But, you know, use your head, um, you know, plan for uh, the bracket to hold up in an impact and you'll be good. Now, the final thing, like I think most race cars should have, is a fire system. Now this is a uh, lifeline system. It uses Novec also. Um, it's in there in the, under a lot of pressure, so this l little bottle is more effective than those gigantic systems that you see. It's small and light, and to me it's like, wow, is this gonna work? But uh, Lifeline assures me that this is the state of the art and it'll put out things better than almost anything. Now the system comes with uh, five nozzles, so we're going to have, uh, we're going to set up to have three shooting in the engine compartment, one on the driver, and then one in the back of the car by the fuel cell. Um, it, it's electrically operated. Um, it has a test, test indicator, so you know if the battery in here is good. It has two switches, so you can have one where the driver can reach it easy and one on the outside so the, the fire guys can reach it and discharge it in case you're knocked out or something. Um, it also has uh, these uh, automatic triggering fuses. Now, um, these things uh, melt at a really low temperature and then they complete a circuit. So, uh, one, this one's for the inside of the car, this one's for the engine compartment, and they both cook off at different temperatures. But if fire gets on these things for any period of time, they'll automatically trigger the system. Uh, in the past, they had G-sensors and all that, but uh, sometimes, like, you could put a wheel off or hit an FIA curb, and it would trigger your system. And this is going to be bulletproof. It's not going to trigger the system unless you're actually on fire, and, uh, you know, you never know. In case you knock, get knocked out or something, you're going to want that system to be going. Um, I know in the case of uh, Michelle's accident, she had to manually operated system with a cable and when she crashed her fire bottle came out of position and kinked the cable so when she tried to release the uh the fire extinguisher fire system it, it wouldn't trigger um you know that's some of the things you got to consider you got to consider your mounts are uh, strong there's enough strain relief in the bottle so your lines don't get pulled out uh, same thing with your wiring uh, good wiring you want to have enough strain relief you want to orient the bottle so your G-forces aren't going to dislodge it, and you want to make sturdy mounts for it. Um, like Michelle's car had, a, you know, everything was done right, but that weird stuff happens, and she wasn't able to trigger her fire system. So it's all stuff to take into consideration. Um, you know, this is a lot of stuff, and, it, you know, it's possibly expensive to a lot of you, but so is your car burning down to nothing. And this stuff could save your day, could also save your skin. Um, and if you don't want to do all this elaborate stuff, you can at least put these in your car. And uh, these will save your bacon too and hardly cost anything and don't take up much room. So don't burn up, don't die. Don't total your car uh, if it can be prevented. So if you like this content, be sure and subscribe. Um, visit our web store. We got a lot of cool merch. We also have parts, and we sell most of the things we talk about. Um, all the uh, proceeds from the sales help fund us to make more content. So until next time, don't burn up.